All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight, uh, we're diving into another sutra. And so tonight, um, so if you haven't been to Dharma Doors for a while, or if it's your first time, uh, we're going to be reading from this book. So this is the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses of the Buddha. So we've been reading from the older sort of uh, original Pali suttas of the Buddha. And tonight we're going to be talking about sutta number 57. This is the Kukura Vatika Sutta, the, uh, the dog duty ascetic. So... Um, this, will, this is a very interesting sutta tonight. We're going to have a lot to discuss. Um, in fact, we have so much to discuss. I'm going to just dive right into the sutta. And I just want to kind of give you the beginning of it so that we can kind of talk about what's going on. But it's, it's a little curious. So again, if you happen to have the Wisdom Publications book, I'm over on page... Uh, 493 this evening. Um, and so let's check out what's going on with the Buddha tonight. So uh, again, this is the Kukura Vatika. Uh, Kukura is a dog. Uh, Vatika is sort of like, you know, the, the behavior, the behavior of a Kukura. So a Kukura Vatika is one who behaves like a, a dog. But let's find out about who this is. So thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One, the Buddha, was living in the Kolyan country, where there was a town of the Kolyans named Halid Davasana. Then Hunya, son of the Kol Kolyans, who was a Govatika, an ox duty ascetic, along with Senia, who was a naked dog duty ascetic. They both went to the Blessed One. Punya, the ox duty ascetic, paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down at one side, while Senia, the dog duty ascetic, exchanged greetings with the Blessed One. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he, so he too sat down at one side, curled up like a dog. Punya, the ox duty ascetic, said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, this Senya is a naked dog duty ascetic who does what is hard to do. He eats his food when it's thrown on the ground. He has long taken up and practiced that dog duty. What will be his destination? What will be his future course? <laughs> All right. So real quick, a little background. So these two practitioners right? Punya and Senya. Well, they're both doing a kind of what would be called a kind of austerity, all right? Now, what they're doing is, and if you look into this or you just kind of read the footnotes, so Punya is what is called an ox duty ascetic. And so part of what he's go got going on is he wears a pair of horns. So a pair of oxen horns, supposedly this was a tradition at the time of the Buddha. And the ox duty ascetic was basically sort of behaving like an ox, looking like an ox, and sort of taking on the identity of an ox. <laughs> but that's qu not quite as wild as Senya who's doing the Kukaravatika, this dog duty ascetic. And so we are to understand that Senya goes around naked, 
walking on all fours, eats only off the ground like a dog, curls up at the feet of the Buddha like a dog. And basically his practice, his religious practice is to behave like a dog. <laughs> All right. Now, I do want to kind of like, it, 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 we're going to get deeper into these practices. So I do want to talk about the, like what's going on with these, but I also want us to kind of like recognize that a suture like this, you could definitely sort of extrapolate if you, if you, if you will. And what I mean by that is whether it's behaving like an ox or behaving like a dog, what this sutra is ultimately going to be about, it's going to be about a certain ideology, a certain religious view. And what the religious view is, it's that if I suffer in this life, I perform austerities, or, you know, maybe I fast, or, you know, maybe, you know, I just perform austerities. And I basically make this life really, really hard on myself. But the ideology is that I'll be rewarded in the next life. I'll be reborn in a heaven. I might even be reborn as a God. So in other words, what I, what I kind of want to get at, hold on one sec. What I want to get at is that, yes, the behavior that these two people are doing is like pretty extreme, but I want us to be able tonight to look at any kind of behavior any kind of view that thinks if I suffer now, later on, it'll be better because of the suffering now. Does that ideology sound vaguely familiar, like meaning outside of the context of this sutra, <laughs> that there might be some idea that I could do things to myself that even though they're uncomfortable, in some future, maybe years from now, or again, maybe in a future life, there will be a payoff for that. Well, that's kind of the way that I kind of want to read this sutta tonight, is I do want to kind of look exactly at the dog, the dog practice and the, the ox practice. But I just want us to know that everything this sutra is going to be talking about, it could go for a lot of other things too. So... Sort of, sort of the no pain, no gain mentality. Indeed, that, that is the idea. You know, it, you could also like, there's a lot of behaviors that, you know, we might get into, but, but actually, before we even do that, let's, let's read a little bit more because I want you to notice something really interesting about the way the Buddha responds to this. So, the ox practitioner, right, Punya, he's asked the Buddha, so Senya, the dog guy, right, what, what, what will be his destination, meaning what will be his rebirth? What will be his future course? Meaning, where, where does this go? Where does the dog duty practice, where, where does that lead? right? And the Buddha responds this way. Enough, Punya. Enough. Let it be. Don't ask, don't ask me that. Huh. A second time, Punya asked the Buddha about the fate, the destiny of, of Senya, the dog practitioner. And the Buddha again said, enough, Punya. Let it be. Don't ask me. A third time, though, Punya, the ox duty ascetic, said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, this Senya is a naked dog duty ascetic who does what is hard to do. He eats his food when it's thrown on the ground. He has long taken up and practiced that dog duty. 
What will be his destination? What will be his future course? Now, the tradition is that if you ask the Buddha anything three times, he has to answer. It's, it's, it's part of the Buddhist tradition. This comes up a lot in suttas where the Buddha would like prefer not to answer, but pressed enough, pressed three times, he has to answer. So even before we listen to the Buddha's answer, I want us to like recognize that the Buddha would rather not talk about it. And what I mean by that is, the dude, you know, Punya, he shows up with his horns and he's like, hey, Buddha. And Buddha's like, hi, have a seat. Senya, right? He's all acting like a dog. And the Buddha's like, have a seat. He's got no problem with what they're doing in that way. It's this ox guy, Punya, who's asked, what about the dog guy? Well, if you really want to know, Punya, he says, well, Punya, since I certainly cannot persuade you when I say enough, Punya, let it be, don't ask me that, I will therefore answer you. He says, here, Punya, someone develops the dog duty fully and uninterruptedly. They develop the dog habit, the habits of a dog fully and uninterruptedly. They develop the dog mind fully and uninterruptedly. They develop dog behavior fully and uninterruptedly. Well, having done so, upon the dissolution of the body after death, they will reappear in the company of dogs. Now, or but, if he, meaning Senya, if he has such a view as this, thinking by this virtue or observance or asceticism or by this holy life, I shall become a great god or some lesser god. That is the wrong view in his case. Now, there are two destinations for one with the wrong view. I say hell or the animal realm. So Punya, if his dog duty succeeds, it will lead him to the company of dogs. If it fails, it will lead to hell. <laughs> All right, so let's back up. So the first part of the, the Buddha's answer is pretty straightforward as far as, well, if he really commits to this and he starts acting like a dog and behaving like a dog and thinking like a dog, <laughs> he'll wind up reborn as a dog. That's what will happen. But notice the Buddha made an addition to his answer and he said, but. If he thinks what he's doing is actually going to lead to like being reborn as a god or something, well, then he actually has the wrong view and he'll be reborn in hell for having the wrong view. So in other words, if this Senia guy just for some reason behaved like a dog, that in a way would be what it is and it would lead to being reborn as a dog. But because he's actually practicing as an ascetic and thinks that it's going to get him somewhere, the Buddha says that's actually kind of worse and it's the wrong view. So before we go forward, any questions about that idea? I know, especially because there's this interesting idea of reincarnation going on, and I know that's always a tricky idea in Buddhism. Everybody okay with the basic premise so far? It gets more interesting, but. Okay. So. When this was said by the Buddha, Senya, the dog duty ascetic, 
he cried out and burst into tears. Then the Blessed One told Punya, the ox ascetic, son of the Kuli, or son of the Kulians, the ox duty ascetic, he said to him, Punya, I could not persuade you when I said, enough, Punya, let it be. Don't ask me that. But then Senya, the naked dog duty ascetic, said, Venerable sir, I'm not crying because the Blessed One has said this about me, but because I've long taken up and practiced the dog duty ascetic. Venerable sir, this Punya guy, a son of the Kulians, he's an ox duty ascetic. He has long taken up and practiced that ox duty. What will be his destination? What will be his future course? So the dog guy wants to know the same thing about the ox guy. The Buddha says, enough, Senya. Let it be. Don't ask me about that. But he asks a second time, and then a finally a third time. A third time, Senya, the naked dog duty ascetic, asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, this Punya, son of the Kalyans, he's an ox duty ascetic. He's long taken up and practiced the ox duty. What will be his destination? What will be his future course? Well, Senya, since I certainly can't persuade you when I said enough, Senya, let it be, don't ask me, I shall therefore answer you. Here, Senya, someone develops the ox duty fully and uninterruptedly. They develop the habits of an ox fully and uninterruptedly. They develop the mind of an ox fully and uninterruptedly. They develop ox behavior fully and uninterruptedly. Having done so, upon the dissolution of the body, after death, they will reappear in the company of oxen. But if they have such a view as this, by this virtue, or this observance, or this asceticism, or by this holy life, I shall become a great god or some lesser god. That's the wrong view in that case. Now, there are two destinations for someone with the wrong view, hell or the animal realm. So Senya, if his ox duty succeeds, it will lead him to the company of oxen. If it fails, it will lead to hell. When this was said, Punya, son of the Kalyans, the ox duty ascetic, cried out and burst into tears. The Blessed One told him, Senya, the naked dog duty ascetic, he said, Senya, I couldn't persuade you when you said, when I said, enough, Senya, let it be. Don't ask me about it. But then Punya, the ox duty guy, he says, Venerable, I'm not crying because the Blessed One has said this about me, but because I've long taken up and practiced the ox duty. Venerable sir, I have confidence in the Blessed One thus. The Blessed One is capable of teaching me the Dharma in such a way that I can abandon this ox duty and that this Senya, the naked dog duty ascetic, can abandon that dog duty. Then Punya, Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, he replied, and the Buddha said this. Punya, there are four kinds of action proclaimed by me after realizing them for myself with direct knowledge. What are the four? There is dark action with dark results. There is bright action with bright result. There is dark and bright action 
with dark and bright result. And there is action that is neither dark nor bright with neither dark nor bright result. Action that leads to the destruction of action. And what punya is kanha karma? So what is dark karma with dark result? And actually, before, before we even dive into this, a quick word about karma. So this whole sutra is about karma. It's about action. But it's specifically, though, in that way, about karma in terms of action and karma in terms of what's called vipaka, result. And this is a really important thing to kind of keep in mind about the idea of karma in the world of Buddhism. Karma, it's literally just physics in terms of like action, reaction. That's all karma means in the world of Buddhism is that just like in your kind of idea of physics that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, the reaction is called a vipaka, and the initial action is called the karma, karma vipaka. And so the Buddha is outlining a view that he says is what he came to realize. This is the, an aspect of the Buddha's abhinya, direct knowledge. And what he says is, is that, well, there's this kanha, kanha karma and kanha vipaka, dark action with dark result, or sukha, sukha karma, sukha vipaka, a bright action with bright results. And then there's like kanha, what is it? Kanha, kanha sukha, karma, mixture. And then there's akanya, asuka neither dark nor bright. So it's this is going to sound, because of the language of bright and dark, it's going to sound like we're talking about good and evil, but pay very close attention to the way this plays out. All right? So we start with the kanha, kanha karma, dark action. And what punya? is dark action with dark results? Well, here someone generates an afflictive bodily formation or an afflictive verbal formation or an afflictive mental formation. Now, the language there, and we got to be very careful about this, is a very technical sutta from this point forward. So, someone generates an afflicted bodily formation. So, those each of those words is very important. So, let's actually deal with the idea of a bodily formation first. Whether or not it's afflicted. <laughs> Let's deal with what is called a kaya samskara or samskara, a bodily conditioning. So what we're talking about, what is being translated as formation, well, you know it as samskara. It's one of those five aggregates that the Buddha is always talking about. It's the aspect of the sentient being, which are the habits Right, So that samskara is the habits and the habituated behavior, the conditioned behavior can be bodily, can be vocal, or can be mental. So in other words, you have behavior, action, but it's habitual. And you can have action of the body or the voice or the mind. 
And then that behavior, that habitual behavior of the body can be afflicted, which is to say afflicted by desire or anger or confusion, some other of the three kleshas or any of the number of kleshas, which are the afflictions. So we're talking about conditioned behavior of the body that is conditioned towards afflictive behavior. This would be something maybe like an addiction to something. So an uncontrollable bodily addiction to something is an afflicted bodily habit. If you are a, um, a what is that called, where you, you, you can't help but lie, <laughs> you are a, a habitual liar, every word out of your mouth is some twisting of the truth in that way, that would be an afflicted verbal habit, I mean, especially if you just did it habitually in that way. And then there's afflicted mental karma. And that is having thoughts, which are just habitual. You're not causing these thoughts to happen. They are just habitually happening and they are afflicted in that way. So someone generates an afflictive bodily formation or an afflictive verbal formation or an afflictive mental formation or habit. Having generated an afflictive bodily habit, an afflictive verbal habit, and an afflictive mental habit, they reappear in an afflictive world. When they have reappeared in an afflictive world, afflictive contacts touch them. Being touched by afflictive contacts, they feel afflicted feelings, exclusively suffering painful feelings, as in the case of beings in the hell realms. Thus, a being's reappearance is due to a being. One reappears through the actions one has performed. When one has reappeared, contacts touch one. Thus I say, thus the Buddha says, beings are the heirs of their karma. This is called dark karma with dark results. Okay. So before we get to the bright stuff, let's dive deep into this dark karma. So again, we've defined afflictive as having to do with those afflictive behaviors the Buddha's always talking about. Remember, greed, it's not just greed for money. It's actually more about things like addictive behavior uncontrollable, needy, wanty craviness. That's an affliction. Anger, ill will, that's an affliction. And then, of course, kind of confusion, conceitedness, contentiousness, pride, all of these things are afflicted as well. And then this, the Buddha has this idea. Having generated afflicted, habitual karmic behaviors, one reappears in an afflictive world. And then, having reappeared in an afflictive world, afflictive contacts touch them. <laughs> so there's a bunch of different ways that we could look at this. A bunch, a bunch of different ways. I want to just give you one kind of very simple example, super simple example. And what I want to do is, is I want to give you an example that sort of takes this out of the realm of rebirth for a moment. I've used this example in the past. I just think it's a really kind of like clear example. So I want you to think of a scenario where someone 
doesn't matter who, but someone lives in like a big apartment building with a, you know, a bunch of other people living in the apartment complex. And I want you to think about someone that lives in that apartment complex and every time they come in and out of their apartment and every time they come in and out of the whole apartment complex building, they're just constantly mad and they just look at everybody with just anger. So every time they come out of their apartment, every time they come in the building, there's a way in which you could imagine that after enough time living in that building, that person is greeted with either people closing their doors or just people giving anger back. But the idea is, is that eventually that person from their anger would find themselves reborn in an angry place in that way. But now think about somebody that comes out of their apartment. Hi, how are you today? And when they're coming into the apartment, they hold the door for people. They're nice. They're friendly. They greet people. All of a sudden, people are going to start seeing this person and they're going to start smiling. Oh, it's you. Hi. And they're going to start holding the door open for you. And the next time you have a bunch of groceries, they're going to help you with your groceries. And all of a sudden, the person's going to find themselves reborn in an unafflicted, unangry world. That's a big part of sort of the lesson of this sutta tonight. It's what the Buddha sort of is getting around when he's talking about this idea that, and this is a quote from the Buddha, the Buddha's quoting himself here, beings are the heirs of their karma. That is the big message for tonight. Like the big message of this sutta and there's, a, there's another way the Buddha puts it. It's a very beautiful way. He says that this, meaning what we call our lives, is just karma's shadow. <laughs> this is the, what you're experiencing right now is the after effect of actions you've already taken. And in response to the after effects, you respond, but to the after effects, and you then keep that little karmic loop going in that way. That's part of what this sutta again is about. It's about this idea that we sort of suffer from our past actions in that way, but it's not from a, a kind of like, a karmic debt, it's again, it's more like physics where it's just like cause and effect, cause and effect in that way. All right. Another interesting line that I feel like we should discuss from this interesting section is the Buddha says that it's where he says, um, so having generated afflictive bodily, verbal, and mental actions, or samskara, habits. So having generated those, they reappear in an afflicted world. When they've reappeared in an afflictive world, afflictive contacts touch them. Being touched by afflictive contacts, they feel afflicted feelings exclusively painful, as in the case of beings in the hell realm. Thus, a being's reappearance is due to a being. So that's a very like technical, complicated statement about what is called bahutta. Bahutta is the idea of a being. And so there's this idea that a being's appearance is dependent upon a being. 
And again, this is the basic idea or the basic teaching of tonight, which is this idea of being the heirs. We are the heirs of our karma. We inherit the karma from yesterday in that sense. Questions about karma, rebirth, reincarnation, being the heirs of your own karma. <laughs> All right, let's go further then. So, and what punya is sukha karma and sukha vipaka? So, and what is bright karmic action with bright results? Well, here, someone generates an unafflicted bodily condition or formation or habit. One generates an unafflicted verbal formation or habit. One develops an unafflicted mental formation or habit. Having generated an unafflicted bodily formation, an unafflicted verbal formation, an unafflicted mental formation, one reappears in an unafflicted world. When they reappear in an unafflicted world, unafflictive contacts touch them. Being touched by unafflictive contacts, they feel unafflictive feelings, exclusively pleasant, as in the case of the gods of refulgent glory. Thus, a being's reappearance is due to a being. One reappears through the actions that one has performed. When one has reappeared, contacts touch one. Thus, I say, beings are the heirs of their actions. This is called bright action with bright results. All right. So, pretty classic idea, of course, which is what happens when you have unafflicted bodily, vocal, and mental habits in that way. Well, they lead to a pleasant future, a pleasant rebirth, even a rebirth among the gods, specifically the gods of refulgent glory, but but basically, the Buddha has outlined the path to hell and the path to heaven. And it all has to do with physical, verbal, and mental behavior. In particular, though, habits in that sense. Cultivating or developing good habits or bad habits in that way. So this kind of polarity right here, this idea, again, and I kind of want to just take one moment to stress this because of where this is going, but I want to kind of really stress that in the world of Buddhism, if you are sort of uncomfortable with the talk of reincarnation, or if, you know, you just the, the idea of the next birth, last birth, if that doesn't do it for you, it doesn't matter. All you actually have to think about is your mentality regarding 10 years from now. And the dream that you may have of 10 years from now being better. That could be you being richer having more, suffering less, whatever it might be. If you're not into the whole idea of like future lives and future rebirth, doesn't matter. Just put it in the context of 10 years from now. And the idea of afflictive behavior, <laughs> again, you can understand that however you are afflicted in that way. <laughs> but afflictive behavior repeated and repeated and repeated 
day after day after day leads to somewhere 10 years from now. In the same way that unafflicted behavior <laughs> repeated over and over again leads somewhere. And the Buddha is basically saying that those two behaviors, they lead to two different places. And it's basically just a matter of physics, kind of subtle psychological physics, because we're talking about the nature of suffering in that way. But that's the idea. The road to hell and the road to heaven. Yeah, Maria. Hmm? Is there? A... <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it seems like um, a Buddhist version of the, the golden rule. Um, and it doesn't seem to me like you have to think about if you think about it that way, you don't have to think about 10 years from now. You can think about right now, right now. Um, and um, if it seems to me that, you know, that's also reinforced. If you're a good Buddhist and you're kind of right with the idea of no self, um, you know, you don't have to think about next life or any of that. It's just right here right now you can create the world you want to live in um and see it so you're you're uh you have some insights from from the end of the sutra so um so yeah we have a couple more stops though before we get there so let's we're going to get back to what maria just commented on so let's do the bright and dark karmic action because this one is this one's interesting in that way so this is going to be section number 10 i'm on page 496 and what punya is dark and bright karma with dark and bright result well here someone generates bodily samskara that's both afflictive and unafflictive. Verbal samskara, verbal habits that are afflictive and unafflictive. And mano samskara, mental conditioning. That's both afflictive and non-afflictive or unafflictive. And having generated a bodily habit or a verbal habit or a mental habit that's both afflictive and unafflictive, they reappear in a world that's both afflictive and unafflictive. When they've reappeared in a world that's both afflictive and unafflictive, both afflictive and unafflictive contacts touch them. Being touched by both afflictive and unafflictive contacts, they feel both afflictive and unafflictive feelings, mingling of pleasure and pain, as in the case of us human beings and some gods and some beings in the lower worlds. Thus, a being's reappearance is due to a being. One reappears through the actions one has performed. When one has reappeared, contacts touch one. Thus, I say, beings are the heirs of their actions. This is called dark and bright action with dark and bright results. All right. And so even though the language of that one might be a little weird. If you read Bhikkhu Bodhi's wonderful footnotes, he makes it clear we're not talking about an action that is both afflicted and unafflictive. No. he's. They're talking about, the Buddha's talking about people that sort of have one foot in the world of afflictive behavior. Maybe you have some addictions, you've got some anger issues, you've got some ego issues. But you're also, you know, a practitioner and you're doing good things and you're working on your karma and you're doing this. And so you you've got pleasure. You have your unafflicted moments, but you have afflictive moments as well. Notice that the Buddha says, yeah, th this is like in the human world. That's what constitutes the human world is you are sometimes pleased, but sometimes suffering. Sometimes it's afflicted, sometimes it's not. What is a hell realm? P 
pure affliction all the time. And I'm sure that when I put it that way, you realize, oh, the hell realms are not down there. Hell re the Buddha knows that the hell realms are not down there. The hell realms are a realm where it's just total affliction. A heavenly realm is where it's totally pleasurable non-affliction. And the human realm is like this, where it's a mixed bag, a little bit of both in that way. Now, one of the main points before we move forward, we've, we've heard it already, but I want to kind of emphasize it. It's where the Buddha says, yes, it's the line where he says, thus a being's reappearance is due to a being. One reappears through the actions one has performed. So what I want to really make clear about that, it, it, it may not have came across. It might not have come across. The Buddha is talking about how there is no God doling out rewards. We make our own reality, which is what Maria said. That's where I said Maria is sort of getting one step ahead of the sutra in that way. Because what the sutra is talking about is, is that, well, let me put it to you this way. There's this beautiful, beautiful saying. It's a, at least I've heard it in a Buddhist context. I haven't found the source. But you often hear this idea in, in Buddhist circles. If you want to understand the past, look at where you are. If you want to understand the future, look at what you're doing. And the idea of that is, is that where you are right now, like especially if you're listening to Dharma doors right now, every decision, every choice that you have ever made in your whole life has led to you being here right now listening to this. And I'm not trying to put Dharma doors up on some pedestal because whatever you had for dinner tonight, every single choice and decision of your life led to that moment, that decision. And again, there was no God who was sort of tapping you in certain directions. It was all your choices, your actions, your decision. And that's what the Buddha means by we are the heirs of our karma in that way. Now, if you want to get deep about it in terms of where we're about to go, from a certain Buddhist point of view, you actually don't have any choice about what it is you're doing. Because all you're doing is receiving, in a way, the experiences that have been set up for you by your karmic action. But you having this experience isn't so much a choice as the, the latest in the karma train of your life, so to speak. So again, the saying is, is that if you want to understand the past, just look at where you are because the whole past led to this. But the other part of that saying is that if you want to understand the future, look at what you're doing because you're setting up the cards for the next round in that way. And so this is where the like Buddhism is really, really tricky when it comes to ideas of like free will versus determinism, because to a very, very, very great degree, there is no free will. We are, again, just responding to what's happening, but habitually in that way. But it's not that it's entirely determined. So there is sort of free will in a way in Buddhism. And, uh, well, we're about to get there. So, so. By the way, I just want us to notice the dark karma with dark results. That's the way to get into a permanently afflicted hell state. 
bright action with bright results is the way to get into an unafflicted, heavenly, pleasurable state. And then notice that the Buddha said that a mixture of bright and dark, that's called being a human. So what's the fourth kind of action that the Buddha realized through direct knowledge? So, and what punya is karma that is neither dark nor bright with neither dark nor bright results? Action that leads to the destruction of action? Well, therein, the chetana, the volition for abandoning the kind of action that is dark with dark result, and the volition for abandoning the kind of action that is bright with bright result, and the volition for abandoning the kind of action that is dark and bright with dark and bright result. This is what is called action that is neither dark nor bright with neither dark nor bright result. Action that leads to the destruction of action. By the way, those are the four kinds of action proclaimed by the Buddha after realizing them through direct knowledge. Dark, bright, dark and bright, and neither dark nor bright action that destroys action. So, and what, let's read this one more time. And what punya is action that's neither dark nor bright with neither bright, bright nor dark result? Action that leads to the destruction of action? What kind of action is that? Well, the volition for abandoning the kind of action that is dark with dark result, the volition for abandoning bright action, and the volition for abandoning the kind of action that is dark and bright. So, huh. <laughs> abandoning the volition for the kind of karma that's bright, or so that's dark, bright, or mixed in that way. Action that destroys action. That's what we kind of want to spend pretty much the rest of tonight talking about. Is what exactly does that mean? <laughs> so we could take it sort of piece by piece. So the volition for abandoning the kind of action that is dark with dark result. So not last week, because I wasn't here last week, but two weeks ago, the sutta that we dealt with, which was the, the sutta right before this, sutta number whatever, sutta number 56, I started, or I, I did, I guess, a little kind of mini Dharma talk about this idea of what's being called volition. It's this idea of chetana. Chetana is the idea of a kind of momentum. It's like karmic momentum. I use the example of a row of dominoes following, falling. And the idea of the row of dominoes falling is that the whole row of dominoes sort of has a momentum to it, a kind of energy to it that isn't in any one of the dominoes, it's a wave energy that sort of is, you know, inclusive of each domino, but not limited to any one domino. Well, if you're, if you're following me on that example of the dominoes falling, Buddhism has this really interesting idea that thought or thinking happens in mind moments. And each mind moment is like a frozen moment of dharmas. And that frozen moment of dharmas has all kinds of, you know, aspects to it. Meaning a mind moment, it's not just what you're perceiving, but it's also how you feel about what you're perceiving. 
So what I mean is, is let's say that you had a, like a, a slight addict, addiction, addictive personality towards whatever it might be. Uh, let's just say sugar, sweets, candy type stuff. Let's just put it, keep it simple. The idea would be that if all of a sudden on the television screen or whatever, an image of, you know, candy or whatever popped up in that mind moment, there would be the perception of being who you are, perceiving an image of whatever it is, and the sort of desire that you may have for it, right? But then the idea is, is that th that mind moment is arising based upon the prior mind moment, which is arising based upon the prior mind moment. And so the idea is, is that mind moment by mind moment, we're perceiving things, but then we have this chetana, this kind of karmic momentum wherein because of my addiction because of my samskara because of my conditioned habitual behavior when i see the image of the sweet there's a momentum of a chetana that's moving me towards it already and then the next mind moment i've gotten closer and the next mind moment i've gotten closer and then the next mind moment i've got it and that that mind moment is is like mm, it's just full of mm, yummy sweetness, right? And that has reinforced the habitual karmic propensity of reaching out addictively towards things like that. So, in other words, that's what I was talking about a moment ago in terms of like there we don't have a lot of free will. Because we have this volition, their habits. And indeed, if you start looking at it, you'll realize that so much of our behavior is habitual, even though we think it's exercising total free will. If we look really carefully, we'll realize, nah, I was just going along with my karma in that way. But what I want you to notice. Real quick, Maria, I want you to notice that you can cultivate the volition for abandoning dark karmic action. In the same way that you may have built up a habitual propensity to satisfy that, you can build up the karmic propensity to abandon it. Maria. Question about anything going on in there? Oh, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's like uh, a hair's breadth of opportunity in each moment, but it's oh, that's it. It's like just only right in this moment because all that volition, all that karmic and it has brought us here and so it's like every single moment we have that opportunity to to cultivate and on top of that whether or not we see that opportunity also a result of all of that past karmic action it seems like and so um yeah um i guess what a rare opportunity we have here to be able to do this and cultivate that and um, see that. So, yeah. Well said, Maria. Well said. Excellent. It's very true that the free will that I speak of, yes, it's only a hair's breadth, as Maria says, in each moment, but it's there. I would like to kind of... Um, kind of go a little further with what Maria just said in terms of like, in terms of the practice of Buddhism, the practice of, of Buddha Dharma, it's not 
totally the free will, but in order to sort of reclaim our free will, the first thing we need to do is stop. <laughs> and what I mean is, is that that's the practice of shamatha. That's the practice of the stopping or the calming down, which is actually about the body, the voice, and the mind are in such volitional overdrive that we actually need to cultivate stillness for a while. And you could cultivate stillness for a very, very, very long time before you could take your first fully mindful step. And I mean literally with your feet, but actually mindful not habitually driven towards this, not habitually fearful and running away from something, but an actual sovereign step. It's what Buddhism sort of really wants us to cultivate is such sovereign karma, or to use the sutra, the karma that destroys karma. That's what Maria is talking about. It's what I'm talking about. It's what the sutra is talking about using action to destroy action. But when they say destroy action, they mean destroying habituated, mindless behavior action. That's the karma that is to be destroyed. And by the way, that's the, that is the idea is that we can be without conditioned habits. And to be without conditioned habits is called Buddha, or at least an Arahat or something like that. That's what it is, is to not be driven by habits, but to be driven or to actually be acting with total clarity of mind. So it's, it's why they often talk about sort of the Buddha or a Buddha as being ubermunch, meaning more than human, superhuman. And that idea that a Buddha or even an Arhat or what have you, the idea that a Buddha is, is beyond human, it's in this sutra. Because to be human is to be in a mixture of pleasure and pain, to be in a mixture of it all. That's to be human. To be a Buddha is to be outside the paradigm of pleasure, pain, and all of that. So... Any other questions or ideas about the volition, that idea of volitional behavior, the practice of just stopping, observing volitional behavior, and eventually watching that volitional behavior kind of stop being conditioned that way? All right. So that is our neither dark nor bright. Right. So again, this is not going to hell, but it's also not going to heaven and being a God. And it's not being stuck as a human. It's being, again, outside the paradigm. All right. All right. Um, and just for the sake of time, let me finish the sutra real quick, but then I have a few more things to say. So Let's notice, this is the end of the sutta, after the Buddha has given this discourse. When this was said, Punya, son of the Kalyans, the ox-duty ascetic, said to the Blessed One, Magnificent, venerable sir, magnificent, venerable sir, the Blessed One has made the Dharma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overturned, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see. From today, let the Blessed One remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. So our Punya, the ox duty ascetic has converted and is now a lay Buddhist. But Senya, 
the naked dog duty ascetic? He said to the Buddha, Magnificent, venerable sir, magnificent. The Blessed One has made the Dharma clear in many ways, as though putting upright what had been turned over, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who is lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyes to see. He said, I go to the Blessed One for refuge, and to the Dharma, and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. I would receive the going forth under the Blessed One. I would receive the full ordination. <gasps> so Senya, the, the dog ascetic guy, he wants to be full in. He wants to be a fully ordained monk, not just a lay person, not just a householder. But the Buddha said, Senya, one who formerly belonged, <clears throat> excuse me, one who formerly belonged to a different sect and desires the going forth and full admission in this dharma and discipline, <clears throat> they live on probation for four months. At the end of four months, if the bhikkhus are satisfied, they give him the going forth and the full admission of the bhikkhu state. But I recognize individual differences in this matter. Senia says, Venerable Sir, if those who formerly belonged to another sect and desire the going forth and full admission in this dharma and discipline live on probation for four months, and if at the end of the four months the bhikkhus being satisfied with them give them the going forth and the full admission to the bhikkhu state, then I'll live on probation for four years. <laughs> at the end of the four years, if the bhikkhus are satisfied with me, let them give me the going forth and the full admission to the bhikkhu state. Then Senia, the naked dog duty ascetic, received the going forth under the Blessed One, and he received the full admission. And soon, not long after his full admission, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute, the venerable Senya, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, here and now entered upon and abided in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. He directly knew birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming to any state of being. And the venerable Senya became one of the Arhats. All right. So, congratulations to Senya, right? So, uh, I don't know about you, but at the beginning of the sutta, I didn't know. I didn't know how this was going to turn out for him. Right. Because he was kind of, you know, he was being called a bad practitioner in that way. But surprise, surprise, he winds up becoming an arhat. Um, by the way, funny last part there, you know, about the rule that the rule you have to live kind of a probationary period for four months, which is pretty standard in a lot of Buddhist countries, by the way. You don't really get to just sign up and be a full monk. Even here they were talking about it if you belong to a different sect, but even if you didn't belong to a different sect, they don't let you just become a fully ordained monk right away. Most monastic traditions have what's called a probationary period. But I do think it's funny that, and I can't help but feel like it's an extension of the whole dog, the dog duty thing. But when he says like four months, I'll live on probation for four years. I can't help but feel like that's an extension of that kind of like dogish duty quality thing, but that's just my read on it. Um, any questions or ideas about what's going on with this sutta? That about again, any.
I mean, I think that this sutta is really interesting, both in terms of like, like, I don't know if you know, you know, much about Indian religion in that way, or especially religion at the time of the Buddha, but there was some wild stuff going on. <laughs> People were doing wild things. And in many ways, like behaving like a dog is not that wild compared to what a lot of people were doing. But again, I wanted to explore this sutra, not just from the point of view of like, oh, that's really weird to like behave like a dog. Like that's weird. I wanted to look at it more from that point of view of the I guess what I called the ideology of asceticism. The ideology being, if I put myself through this now, in the future, it'll be better. There will be a payoff for that. And ultimately, of course, what the position of Buddhism is on that is that there is only now in that way, and this has come up a few times tonight, so suffering now is just suffering now. <laughs> there, there is no idea, there is no such thing as like suffering now, but as a result of that, not suffering later. For the Buddhist tradition, there's just either suffering now or not suffering now. And suffering now is all based upon craving <laughs> wanting you you fill in the blank because <laughs> we all sort of want different things in that way but the the common denominator and by the way this is a common denominator among all sentient beings all sentient beings either want so this or they want that and they're upset if they don't get it you know, you put the you put a bone on the other side of a fence and a dog's going to be upset that he can't get at the bone because he wants it, but he can't get what he wants. And that's what the Buddha called suffering, craving and wanting what you can't really have in that way. You can't actually have 24-7 pleasure all the time. You can't. We want that. And then we get upset when that doesn't turn out. And so that's the cause of suffering again. Now, the craving. The good news of Buddhism is, is that that suffering can end right now because you cannot suffer. You can, meaning you cannot crave. <laughs> you can do it <laughs> in that sense. But the wanting, of course, is what we talked about tonight in terms of the habits. We're up against our habits. We're up against the conditioned behavior. So, Lane, did you have a question, comment, idea? Thank you, Michael. Um, I think this is one of my favorite ones. Because um, it's, I think it's something I've been working with for a couple of years. Um, and my one of my first thoughts was like kind of about the now versus later idea and I it might started with like well oh, but what about things you have to balance like you can't spend all your money now because you have to save for retirement or you know you can't eat junk food now because you want to be healthy later so there is this kind of trade-off but then even as you kept talking I was like wait a minute <laughs> like why am I perceiving caring for my future self as some kind of deprivation or some kind of suffering now, or why am I, you know, or I've gotten good at exercising in the last year and I hated exercising my whole life. And now I enjoy it because I see it as like loving myself, treating myself well. So like, why would I perceive this? As, oh, this punishing exercise. It's so terrible, but we have to do it to be good <laughs> later. No, actually it is all, perception like to perceive no i am this is my self love right now this is this is how i show that i care about myself is by exercising or you know taking care of future lane or you know eat, eating food that makes lane 
feel strong, you know, it, it it's all, it, it's all right here. Right here. <laughs> Beautiful lane. So many, so many beautiful examples in there. Um, let's just take in a way, um, kind of eating. Let's take the idea of like eating healthy in that way. Indeed. One of the ideas is, is that like, oh, but this, but this junk food tastes so good. And I know that if I keep eating it later on, it'll be bad, but right now it's so good. Yeah, but there's habits and there's conditioning in thinking that it is pleasurable and good, right? And like with exercise or anything, if you change your habits, all of a sudden, eating a really healthy meal is very pleasurable and eating a greasy, nasty, like takeout food is all of a sudden not pleasurable and all of a sudden... It's pleasurable eating now. It's pleasurable going to bed with that. And it's pleasurable in the morning. Like, oh, it's win, win, win. And it requires that um, noticing habits, noticing those behaviors, and then potentially noticing like, oh, this isn't actually healthy for me. And moving the needle, moving the behavior. Excellent. I'm happy to hear that, Lane. I'm happy to hear that this sutta resonated that way. Like, because I, I like it too. I think it's so, and I had never really heard the particular language of this sutta of the dark karma, bright karma. I thought that was like interesting language. Again, I want to point out that the Buddha doesn't judge the dog guy and the ox guy. And it's almost like why he was like, you know, let's not even get into it because I don't actually want to badmouth these guys. I don't re really want to talk about them going to hell. So let's talk about something else. And I think that that's really important to notice that the Buddha was cool with them doing whatever they were doing and they were just going to sit around and chat. And it was the ox guy that like instigated the whole uh, conversation. So I think that's an important thing to take away from the sutta as well. That, so, cool. Brendan? I just, I liked what, uh, what Lane was saying, like the, uh, like it's like, rather than like deprivation or like you're making like a bargain with your future self to like, hey, you know, I'll feel I'll be happy that I ate healthy in the future. It's like even that's kind of problematic rather than like, you know, this is like it's nice to do nice things for yourself or for others. And like it's wise and there's and there's like a difference between, you know, enjoying like maybe a dessert or whatever versus like, yeah, like another another like eat, enjoying the pleasures of food in which yeah it's like it doesn't feel good or it feels you know like you're not supporting yourself or something like there's just like such a difference there um mm -hmm. and uh and then yeah and then i just i think uh the uh just as a comment like and i think uh let's see uh maria yeah like the, the, the about the thing about free will and uh and I was, you know, I think I asked you a while back, but yeah, like the, what, you know, how does Buddhism deal with free will? Um, and this is just, it's nice to read something where it's, I mean, you could try to do absolute free will and yet it seems like we do have it. And this is kind of getting to that as like, you know, being like not only useful, but like liberating and you know, you know, I don't tend to get into the absolutism with free will because it seems like we have it, but it doesn't seem like we have it when we're when we're in <laughs> habit. And and if we're if we have a meditation practice, there is more space to be like, wait a minute, like, do I want to talk to myself that way, or do I want to like do do whatever, you know, problematic karmatic things, you know, or you know, things that are going to cause problems down the road. Mm -hmm. um or whatever and not feel good so i just like i mean that was more comment but i just dug dug that and and the comments as well nice. thanks mike yeah cool 
Yeah. And again, I just want to really, because I know it sometimes uh, it's a really important point that gets missed, but it's that really, really like interesting idea that yes, it's, it's good to do good things versus bad things. And the idea of like, yeah, you, it's good to go to heaven. <laughs> it's yeah. You don't want to go to hell, but you know, what's even more wild <laughs> not trying to go to heaven or hell. And I, that's where I want to like put like Buddhism is so subtle that way because it's a weird religion because most religions in their own way are trying to get you to go to heaven. Like meaning do good for whatever reason we've decided, do good, not bad. And it has these kind of rewards. And Buddhism's kind of saying like any reward thinking is problematic because it's going to be putting you out of again this kind of precious now in that way and put you kind of in the 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 ox race or the rat race or the dog race so yeah all right so we it was a tiny sutta tonight so let's uh pause there for now unless there's any last comments or questions oh yeah maria Just one last comment, um, sort of in response to what Lane said, and that is that uh, my thought was, isn't this sort of the, at least for me, biggest, one of the biggest reasons that I practice is to be able to cultivate the ability to see this and to be able to see which things cause me to, to suffer and to, to try to find a way to course correct, but also cult cultivate the ability to be honest with myself about these things <laughs> and which things, um, you know, are onward leading and which things ultimately cause me to suffer. So yep. um, for me, that's a big piece of it, at mm -hmm. least if not all of it. <laughs> um, so. Nice. Thank you. Yep. Happy to hear. Happy to be here to uh, recondition us towards the Dharma. So. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's it for me. Um, I'll be back next Sunday night. Thanks all for being here. Great to see you.